In today's video, we're going to look at the six reasons that you need to have a health care directive. My name is Gregory Singleton. I'm an estate planning and probate attorney with Signature Law. Signature Law is an estate planning and probate law firm that serves the Twin Cities and greater Minnesota alike. Just as a reminder, if you uh, like today's video, please feel free to smash that like and subscribe button. It really helps support the channel. Also, before we get going, a couple caveats. First of all, this video is for educational purposes only. I'm not giving legal advice. And second of all, we're going to be talking about Minnesota law in this video. So if you're in another jurisdiction, it's very likely that a lot of what we talk about will apply to your uh, to your jurisdiction's laws, but make sure to talk to an estate planning professional in your jurisdiction before you uh, uh, go ahead and plan your estate. So a health care directive I find to be an incredibly powerful and important document that's an important part of your estate plan. Um, there are six reasons that I think they're incredibly important to have. Probably a few other reasons, but these are the ones that I was thinking of today. And the first one is the health care proxy. Now remember, a health care directive is two documents. Essentially, it's going to be the health care proxy, which will appoint health care agents. And secondly, it will be a living will, which will give instruction to those agents about what decisions you want them to make while you're incapacitated. With a durable power of attorney and guardianship directive, uh, those two documents act more as a gatekeeper. Remember, there are three types of a durable power of attorney. There's the financial durable power of attorney, the health care directive, and the guardianship directive. Now, with a guardianship directive, you can certainly watch someone's kids, but if you have to deal with the schools or you have to take them to the hospital, you're going to need that legal authority and the hospitals will not deal with you. If you need someone to handle your financial affairs while you're incapacitated, you'll need a durable power of attorney that is approved by the banks. Otherwise, they're not going to talk to you with whatsoever. With healthcare directives, it's a slightly different. Imagine you haven't done a healthcare directive and you have not appointed an agent. Under the Minnesota Department of Health guidelines, you will still get treatment. Your healthcare provider will listen to those people who are closest to you uh, to uh, have say about what your treatment preferences are. And that's dangerous language. Who are the people closest to you? Now, on one hand, we can look at the, the malicious side. Let's say you, you're in the middle of a divorce or you got a divorce. Uh, your spouse could come in and, and uh, uh, or ex-spouse could come in and say, oh, I'm the person closest to him. Here are the decisions I want. Pull the plug. Uh, now, if they do that, they're going to get in some real legal trouble, especially if that's not what you want. Uh, criminal liability applies to that situation. But let's look at a more common situation, which is not one out of malice, but one out of good intentions. Imagine you've got four siblings. Three of them are uh, local, and one of them lives in, let's say, California. And the three of them that are local have the same views as you. And your view in this case is if you're, let's say, if you're in a persistent vegetative state for more than three weeks to end all life-sustaining procedures. Now, your sibling, let's make it a sister in California, has a different view on life. And their view on life is that if you end life-sustaining procedures, that is suicide and that is ethically, morally, and religiously wrong. Now, you go into a coma, sister from California comes to town. What do the doctors do when all four of your siblings are saying different things? Three of them are saying, you know, let's end life-sustaining procedures. The sister from California says, nope, keep them alive no matter what. Do the doctors say, well, it's three against one, so we're going to end life-sustaining procedures? No. They maintain life-sustaining procedures and send you to court and let a court decide. Now, it's in this situation, it might be very likely that the three local siblings will get their way, but you're going to be left on life support during that time. The second reason you're going to want to get a health care directive is to get what you want. Remember, a living will is the second part of your health care directive. And in that, you provide instructions on treatment, on body disposition, on uh, your goals, everything that you could imagine under the sun. And if you don't have a living will, you're not going to be giving those instructions. Now, some people counter this by saying, well, my healthcare agent is my spouse. And I've had conversations with my spouse and they know what I want. But I would counter this two ways. One is uh, just empirically, I've had... Uh, Couples, I've sat down with couples and said, let's do a healthcare directive. And they say, we just want to appoint an agent. We don't want to fill out your silly intake forms. We know what each other wants. And I'll say, 
just fill out this first page of the intake form and then let's compare notes. And nine times out of 10, it'll turn out that one spouse wants the plug pulled immediately, for example, if they're in a persistent vegetative state, and the other spouse wants to stay alive as long as possible. And then what inevitably happens is one gets angry at the other because they're saying, you were gonna pull the plug on me, you jerk. And uh, I'm a counselor, but I'm not a marriage counselor, so I can't help them in that regard. All I can do is say, let's fill out the rest of the intake forms. The other thing to keep in mind is you may have had in-depth conversations with your spouse or your primary healthcare agent about what you want. But what if you're in a car accident is with them and they're unavailable at the same time and we have to go to a successor agent? Um, usually you have at least one or two successor agents. Are you gonna have that same conversation with them? Probably not. Um, and if so, that's a lot of burden. We can get rid of that burden by very simply filling out a living will distributing it to everyone and making sure they know that those are your instructions. The number three reason for getting a healthcare directive is to actually get what you actually want. Now remember, a living will is a written list of instructions about what you want to have happen to you if you're incapacitated. When that comes about, you're incapacitated. This is a very incredibly emotional time for your family, for your loved ones, for those people that you've identified as your healthcare agents. And their memory of things, of what you've told them, is not gonna be nearly as clear as what you've written down. Remember, ambiguity and uncertainty are invitations into court. And on a side note, your attorney should be working with you on your answers to your healthcare uh, directive living will to make sure that they are clear and in your voice and say what you want them to say. The fourth reason to get a healthcare directive is for family cohesion. Uh, you don't write things down, you just tell people, all of a sudden, child and your children are healthcare agents, or the, the ones that are not nominated, but are there. Uh, one kid could say, dad really doesn't want that. The other one could say, dad really wants that. And let me tell you, this is an emotional time. People buckle down with what they believe is uh, the right thing to do, and they'll start fighting and we don't want them to do that. We want to give them the gift of saying, here's the clear instructions, please don't fight, I love you both and I trust your uh, decisions on the matter. Similarly, and this is uh, for reason 4A, um, just something I've seen a lot is body disposition. Your healthcare directive can instruct what you want to have happen to your body after you die. And a lot of people will say, I want cremation. But the big question is what happens with your ashes? I have seen families duke it out left and right about who gets to keep the ashes. Do we want to keep the ashes together? Should we bury them? Should we put them in a mausoleum or whatever it may be? It causes fights. And let's avoid that by just putting your instructions. I want to be cremated and spread my ashes in Timbuktu or whatever it may be. Put that in your healthcare directive. It helps immensely. The fifth reason you should have a healthcare directive is to identify in the directive where your health or your estate planning documents are. In a properly, in my opinion, a properly drafted healthcare directive, it will say at the end, and I also have a will, a revocable living trust, a durable powers of attorney, and they are, the originals are kept here. Now, uh, and that'll be in the, the safe in my bedroom uh, of my house. Now, some people say, oh, that's not necessary because I'm gonna distribute copies of everything to everyone but that's a little bit dangerous. First of all, durable powers of attorney are incredibly powerful documents and we tend not to want those distributed until they're needed. Second of all, even if you distribute copies to everyone, we need the original will when push comes to shove uh, to get through probate. And if you don't have a will-based plan, but instead have a revocable living trust-based plan, we're still if need be, we're gonna need the original pour over will. And if someone challenges the revocable living trust, you're really gonna to wanna to have that original trust document just to make sure that, uh, otherwise it, 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 it's, it's a key piece of evidence for determining what is the actual trust. The final reason you want a healthcare directive, and I save the best for last, or at least the most important to last, is peace of mind for your family. At least peace of mind for the healthcare agent. It's a huge decision to sit there and say, you know what, uh, mom's mom or dad wanted me to end life-sustaining uh, measures 
if they're in a persistent vegetative state. No matter how much you've talked to them about it, uh, people's minds get foggy. It's an incredibly difficult decision. And that working with hospice workers and doctors and nurses and some social workers, they find this to be an incredibly difficult situation. Um, and But having a healthcare directive that in the voice, uh, in your voice says what your instructions are, makes it easier for them to make that decision. And more importantly, makes it so that they aren't haunted for the next 10 to 20 years of, did I do the right thing about and uh, facilitating the end of my mom's or my father's or my brothers or sisters or my kids' life. That's that's a big thing. People do get haunted by this. Uh, having a healthcare directive is an incredible gift to your loved ones, to your family, and to the people that you appoint as healthcare agent, and to yourself in many ways. So that is my top six reasons that you need to have a healthcare directive. I really hope you liked today's video. If you did like today's video, please feel free to smash that like and subscribe button. It actually really helps support the channel. We do a new video every other Wednesday. We're getting into our essential series, uh, so you can look forward to that. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below or just send me an email. Otherwise, until next time, this is Gregory Singleton from Signature Law.